Hello, I'm Ian Lindsay from Game Digits, and here's how I made unexpected panic for the Acer Roller Jam Zero. Okay, so let's start by having a look at the Game Jam page to see what theme I've got to make a game around. The theme is aberration. What's that mean? It's a departure from what is normal, usual, or expected, typically one that is unwelcome. The jam was 14 days long, but I only had 9 clear days to work on it, so I spent the first few days just thinking of ideas in the back of my mind while I was working on other things. Then 5 days later, I was ready to start on that one idea that seemed to be the most fun. As with most games I make, I started with just boxes, and in this case, I made a first person controller using a YouTube tutorial by Brackies. I then implemented the ability to pick up these boxes and have them follow a target which is always placed slightly in front of the player. When dealing with physics objects like this, I find it's always best to have a separate target rather than trying to place the physics object itself. Now I wanted this game to be driven by narration with talking characters, so I record my voice and pitch it up as a test. I then implemented a system to read the volume at runtime, and with this I just scale up a box and use it as a mouth. I then add a couple more boxes for the eyes, and here he is, introducing Capsual McCapsual Face. It works surprisingly well, and here he is. Hey, hey you! I'm over here! You can use the mouse to look around. You can even use the WASD keys to move around. Get yourself over here! Have you not played games before? I then put in a start button and more physics boxes, but added logic to these, so that if they go beyond a maximum distance of a specific object, they will push back as if they're on elastic, and will instantly be dropped by the player. I also added a line renderer between these objects, to make it look like they're attached by cables. Thankfully, the initial test of the speech worked, so I went ahead and wrote the script and recorded the audio for the first section of the game. And here's some of the original audio. What? You broke the start button! What's management gonna say about this? As this was a solo game jam, I then pitched the voices to make them sound different for different characters. What? You broke the start button! What's management gonna say about this? I did try and put on a dodgy fake accent, who knows where they're from, but I wanted the characters to pressure you into doing the actions in the game and get increasingly frustrated the longer you take. So I had this idea where some of the characters would get aberration disease, which is unexpected and certainly unwelcome. So I built an extra section where I could introduce another character who had this disease. Initially the character would teleport when sneezing, but I changed this later so objects around the character would teleport instead, which gave much more scope gameplay-wise. Here's how it looked at the white boxing stage. Hey, hey there, don't get too close. I've got aberration disease. Every time I sneeze, like, something unusual happens. Ah, 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 and shoot! Huh. See what I mean? After that, I built another room on the other side for the security bot fight, and started on the bot script, which basically moved the bots towards random nodes that I place in the room, and waits there for a certain amount of time. The bot would have a health value, and when a thrown box collided with it, it responded to the collision event, and removed health depending on how hard it was hit. For the player, I then added a feature where you could hold down the mouse button and charge up the velocity value in order to throw the boxes. I also added a new UI element, which filled up as this velocity increased. So now, you can pick up a box, hold down the mouse button, and chuck it at another box, a red one, and the number will go down. That's gameplay gold. So with a lot of the initial game logic in and working, I then focused on recording and editing the voice audio. There's about 20 minutes of voice recordings in the game, where the characters just keep talking if the player doesn't perform the action. Some of the funniest bits are in sections where you just leave it, but I imagine the vast majority of players won't even hear these. But that's okay. 
because now I'm going to make you listen to some of the fake sneezes I did for the game. Achoo! 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 Absolutely worth it. This next step was a very time-consuming process. This is the bit of the jam where I really buckle down. I repeatedly went through the game from start to finish, putting in all of the voice samples, getting it to feel right, retaking audio, fixing any bugs and tweaking the gameplay until everything worked as best as I could in the time. By this point, I was five days into the nine days I had. I only had four days left. I wanted to reach a point where the gameplay was fun and solid enough that I had several days to do the artwork and really polish it. Because at this point, it was still just boxes and didn't look anywhere near finished. It was at this point I tried the web version of the game and built it as a HTML5 target in Unity. It all looked good, but then I found there was a big problem in the game. When running it in a browser, the mouths weren't moving with the voice. It was fine in the editor. I tried different browsers, but none of them worked properly. And after debugging, I found that the get spectrum data function just doesn't work properly in the browser. In the end, I decided to write a tool to go through all of the voice samples and store off the volume values for every fixed update time step into a scriptable object. Therefore, I can use these at runtime to set the volume in the fixed update of the character to drive the mouth, instead of trying to read the audio source directly. This worked and everything, but it was a lot of additional time. Not only did I have to write the tool and generate the volume data, I also had to change everywhere where I referenced the voice audio, which now had to include the voice samples that came from the scriptable object. So no sleep for me that night. Anyway, I'm on the sixth day of my nine days now, and I'm starting to model the environment. I first look at the white boxes and decide where the rooms will split. This was quite easy in this case, because there's doors between very distinct rooms. I start by matching the white boxes in Unity, and modelling them in Blender, and then applying some base textures. For this, I wrote a PBR shader, which takes a colour palette texture, a diffuse texture, and a detail texture, as well as a normal map. For performance, I put the same texture types together into the same atlas, so then I can use texture arrays in unities so I can tile the subtextures. This means I can use one material across the entire environment and dramatically reduce the number of draw calls. I can colour the surface by using the palette texture, then apply different detailed textures by altering the UVs, but still have a great deal of texture resolution because these are tiled using the texture arrays. Anyway, enough about the shaders. As you can see here, I'm modelling the basic room shapes in Blender, cutting out the various doors and openings, then replacing the white boxes in Unity with these models instead. I also added corridors between the rooms to give it more vertical height, as it seemed a bit flat. Next, I add the initial lighting, build the light maps, and add reflection probes to give surfaces some shininess. I then add more details into the environment. Now that I know the basic wall structures are going to stay the same, I can model some of the details. I then model the dressing objects. These use the same PBR material as the rest of the environment, but are separate objects. These are like decorations, pipes, frames and doors. Pipes are great as dressing objects. You can model a few variations and use them everywhere. The additional benefit of having dressing objects separate like this is that you can make them static so they can be part of the occlusion culling so they won't be drawn if they're behind any other part of the environment from the player's view. So on day 7, after a crazy amount of modelling and texturing, this is where I'm at. Hey! Hey you! Come over here! You can use the mouse to look around? You can even use the WASD keys to move around. Get yourself over here. Great, now, this is what we call the main menu. You can just press that start button and we can get started. Just aim the cursor over it and press that mouse button. 
It's really easy. Just aim and press. Well, you got over here, so I assume you know how the mouse works. Now it's time to model a dynamic objects. This is done a bit differently. They use a different PBR shader. For these, I still model them in Blender, but colour the vertices for different types of material and then use Substance Painter to texture them. I then felt like I was on the home stretch, but then there was so much more left still to do. So I did some more scripting, some more modelling. Took far too long to choose what the doors would look like for some reason. I then thought it would be a good idea to add a colour aberration effect in the game. Aberration was a the theme after all, and it seemed like everyone else was doing it. For this, I did it entirely in script, and used the draw mesh function to render different coloured versions of the same mesh, and procedurally move them depending on the camera view. And here's the effect in action on a test cube. It looks very aberrational. And because it's on a script, I can add the effect to any object just by adding the component. Great stuff. Another thing I wanted to add was a tint colour to the shaders for the light maps and the dynamic lighting. This is so I can have overall control of how bright the lighting is using one global shader parameter. I use this to create an alarm effect, but also to change the overall lighting depending on the vertical position of the player. Therefore, if you go up to the security bot room, it has a bluey green tint to it, while if you go down lower to the basement, then it is brighter and a more yellow-orangey colour. This is done by using a uniform shader parameter, which the shaders then read and can tint the colour in their lighting calculation. By this point the environment's looking okay, but it was still a bit bare. So I modelled some more dressing objects, things like electrical cabinets, boxes, pipes, and I put them around the place to fill it up a bit more. Okay, so the environments were looking good, but there was still one obvious thing that looked unfinished. Capsule McCapsule Face. He just needs a makeover. Time to get modelling! At lightning speed! Okay, that's skin now. Let's try it in the game. Hmm. Nihihu. It's looking great. Apart from the heads going off to infinity, the IK works fine on the arms. Okay, I fixed the head, but now it looks like we've got a bit of an eye problem. So, I fixed the eyes. Now it's time for the full makeover. So the model is done. Now every good robot needs bouncy antennas. For this I used the dynamic bone asset, which is the only external asset I used in the game. With that in place, the robot now looks like this. We can just press that start button and we can get started. Great stuff. Now let's finalise a robot model by modelling the panels in Blender and adding textures in Substance Painter. The characters in the game are set up with IK targets for the hands and the head using Unity's animation rigging package. And for the animations, I motion capture a VR headset and controllers and act out the scene, storing the position and rotation of these every fixed update. I then store these in scriptable objects as animation files. We're well into the eighth day, and this is what the robot looks like now. This is what we call the main menu. Nice, I'm happy with that, but the security bot needs some serious work, and there's only one and a half days left. So I model and texture the security bot. I also add the script logic, make animations for the aberration split, and then add some more scripting. With a bit more scripting. And then more scripting. And then, for the final bit, I added some more scripting on top. After all that scripting, I felt it was particle time. So I made a bunch of effects using Unity's particle system. 
Okay, I'm on the final day now, but after a solid eight days of literally doing nothing else but develop this game, I was starting to seriously feel the burnout. However, it needed one last push to get everything finished and polished as much as possible, ready for submitting to the jam. I have huge respect for anyone who goes through this jam process, and no matter what your experience, your background, or how far through your development journey you are, making something that only existed in your head to be in a fully playable game is an astounding achievement, especially given such short time constraints. I'm really glad this jam had constraints of not using AI. It just shows what raw talent and creativity there is out there. Anyway, enough of all that. I need to finish this thing, and I've got icons, a title screen, screenshots, not to mention to fill the jam submission page. Right, let's get this thing done. Finally done. Hey! Hey you! Go over here! Great, now, this is what we call the main menu. You know, a button left unpressed is a sad button. Don't make that button sad. Hey there, don't get too close. I've got aberration disease. And <laughs> shoot! See what I mean? The emergency systems have activated. Just in case there was a security breach. I am a security bot. Intruder alert. I have no weapon, so I can't do anything about it. Whatever you do, for example, don't hit the red aberration with the red box, and definitely do not hit the blue aberration with the blue box. Ah! I died. Application exit. Thanks for watching the making of Unexpected Panic. Please like and subscribe for more devlogs, and I'll see you in the next video.